listening to the Web3 Prof Podcast. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am here with Jonathan Simkin, who is the co-founder and the current president of 604 Records. Thanks for being with me here today. I'm actually the only president that's ever been for this company. Do you think there'll be one after you? That's a great question. Can I apply for the job? I, you can apply for the job. <laughs> I don't think you'd want it, man, if you knew what it was. Involved, maybe I mean, you seem like a pretty happy guy. Can't be that bad. Um, I don't know if happy, like most people who know me, that wouldn't be how they characterize. They wouldn't me. say, oh, wouldn't Jonathan, say, what a happy guy. No, they wouldn't say unhappy either. They, it's, you know, I mean, there, there's a certain part of the Jewish DNA, which, you know, <laughs> being um, a malcontent kind of comes with that to some degree, you know. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Okay, so how did you get into the business that you're in today? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, weird story, actually. Uh, so, um, I went to law school in the 80s in Toronto, and um, my um, intent at that point was to do criminal law, and in fact, um, most of the courses I took were criminal law courses. Didn't take copyright, didn't take any intellectual property courses, um, and um, I even had a little bit of interest in the entertainment law stuff at that point, enough to go to a meeting. They had a meeting at the school, like, anybody interested in the entertainment law? <laughs> and I took one look around the room and went, blech, you know, I just, um, it just didn't feel like my, my people. Mm. And so I, I didn't bother. So I go to law school, I come home, I start a practice, I'm doing poverty law, uh, refugee claims and, um, you know, downtown east side sort of stuff. And I moved into an apartment building in 1992-ish, and my next door neighbors were in a band, and um, signed to Network Records. Yep. And um, I just became friends with them, like they were my next door neighbors. Um, you know, I'd come home from court, and they'd be like, "Hey, come on over, smoke a joint, tell us about you know your case today." Yeah. And um, you know, I'd go to parties with them and 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 stuff like that. And um, you know, I'd have all these musicians sort of coming up to me like. Hey man, are you really a lawyer, man? Like you don't look like a lawyer. That's, <laughs> that's cool, man. Uh, like you, you did you have long hair like this? I like think, yeah, for the most of my yeah. life, yeah. And um, and and I certainly never dress very formally or anything. And uh, I'd be like, sorry, man. Uh, you know, here's my card. You get busted for pot, drunk driving. I'm your guy. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, it's not what I do. But the more people asked, you know, the the more I started to wonder, like. Maybe this is God's way of um, telling me there's something else I can do with my mm. life. I've always loved music. I was even in a band in law school. No serious aspirations, just fun. Mm -hmm. But music has always been very important to me. And um, so I was like, you know, maybe it's worth a try. So the first client I approached was Matthew Good, mm. um, who nobody knew who he was then. He was playing some gig, I can't remember the club, some small club, and he was not like the band that became the Matthew Good Band. He was more like a Bob Dylan at that point. Oh, interesting. Kind of a folky, I think he even had one of those funny um, harmonica oh, yeah. holders. Yeah. Um, and I kind of said to him, hey man, um, I think you're great. Um, you know, uh, give me six months to try and get you a record deal. And if I get you one, um, you pay me a fair wage, and if I don't, you don't pay me anything. So you were kind of acting as his agent at that? No, as his lawyer, but the, the business was different than the music business. Um, you know, number one, it was almost entirely controlled by major labels, mm. and um, and lawyers were kind of the route into the major labels for a lot of people. Like, if you were known in that world, then you would be like a trusted resource, and so I had connections at different record labels, and that's how I made a living for a while was, you know, getting bands, record deals, uh, either Canadian or U.S. major labels. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> the business has changed a lot since then, so mm. I don't, uh, the, lawyers don't really do that to the same degree or in the same way as they did back mm. then. Interesting. And so, um, so you, out of that, you started 604 Records, or was, was that the, was no. that the beginning? So that was the beginning of my law practice as an entertainment lawyer. I see. And so, um, and I was the right guy in the right city in the right moment in time. There were other entertainment lawyers here, but they were working at big firms. They were super expensive. 
And so I got a reputation pretty quickly of like, hey, there's this young guy and he doesn't charge an arm and a leg and he's willing to do spec deals. And, you know, I was working in the Dominion building, you know, on Camby and mm -hmm. Hastings. I had an office that I think was $150 a month, <laughs> tiny little office, very little overhead. I was paying my rent with legal aid, refugee cases, crim uh, criminal law cases. And um, all of a sudden I was, you know, I was the guy who got Matthew Good a record deal. Yeah. So then Holly McNarland approached me. And then I was Holly McNarland's lawyer. And then Age of Electric approached me. And then this band and, and that band. And um, Len, remember Steal My Sunshine? Mm -hmm. That band. That was sort of the first band where I had an international success. I see. Um, and um, and then Nickelback. And ironically, the, the Nickelback story is funny because um, they... Um, they needed a lawyer for, they had a management offer. H had they already been well-known at no, that time? No, no, no. Okay. In fact, I'm not even sure they were called Nickelback yet. Okay. I think they were still Village Idiot. Um, <laughs> this is almost 30 years ago. Okay. Like Chad was a teenager. Oh, wow. So we're talking a little ancient history. So, uh, you know, they, they went and saw a different lawyer um, and the lawyer's like, oh, I'm going to need a retainer of like $3,000. So they were like, oh, shit. So, um they went to SoCan mm -hmm. and sort of said, hey, like, we need a lawyer. We've got a manager. And the woman at SoCan, Dorothy Allen, God bless her, uh, she said to them something like, um, well, there is this new lawyer in town. Um, <laughs> he's young, and I'm sure he's a lot less expensive than so-and-so. Um, but he is a bit of a loose cannon. <laughs> um, and they were like, that sounds good to us. <laughs> so they called me, and this other lawyer's loss was my gain. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and then you, so you then worked with like one of the biggest bands in recent history Still based do. on that. 11th biggest selling musical act in history. 11th biggest in history. And probably cracked the top 10 because some of those in the top 10 haven't, aren't making records anymore. And Nickelback still is. Big time. This <laughs> new record's doing great. That is incredible. So, what yeah, an amazing. 29th year with them, 28th year. Wow. I love that. What a cool, what a cool story. Um, so now we're in the the world of. Um, at some point, you came into the intersection of Web three, and you started looking at NFTs. And I've seen you on a couple panels talk about this kind of stuff, and yeah. and that's really you know that's really what we're here to to talk about today. So, um, how do you see kind of the artistic and musical landscape um, intersecting with Web three, and and why is this interesting to you? So. Um my entry point into it is also another, like most of the stories of my career, just kind of a combination of a fluke and being opportunistic. <laughs> um, um, we have a band on our label uh, called Coleman Hell. Do you okay. know that band? No. They had a really big hit six, seven years ago. There must be something in the water. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two heads went to number three in the U.S. Like mm. it was a big hit. And it's three guys from Thunder Bay. And um, one of the guys um, was, I guess, a little, he was the least musical of the three. He's musical, but, you know, the two of the guys were, like, writing most of the material. Mm -hmm. And this third guy, Misha, was often doing a lot of the aesthetic. So he would do the artwork for the singles. And like clockwork, we'd put out a single and the phone, sorry, the phone would ring. And it would be like, hey, I saw that single you just put out. Um, I love the artwork. Who did it? So, <laughs> so one of the guys in the band, oh man, does he ever do artwork for other bands? Mm -hmm. I'd say, yeah, I'm sure he would. So he sort of had the side gig going of um, doing art for other bands. And, um, you know, like with many bands, they had their big hit and struggled a little bit. And, you know, Misha called me, I don't know, three years ago, a little bit more maybe, and sort of said, look, I'm I'm not sure I want to be in the band any any longer. You know, my my art career seems to be blowing up. I'm uh, My Instagram is blowing up. And I want to maybe focus on that. And if I do that, you've been my music manager for six years. Would you be willing to help me on that? And I did what I always do, which is I said, let me think about it and talk to my wife about it a bit and said, you know what, man, I, let's do it. This sounds fun. Well, that's Mad Dog Jones. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> I love I love how you throw that in the end. That was Mad Dog Jones. That is that is Mad Dog Jones. Incredible. So I, I started working with him in that capacity. And, and this was before NFTs. So, I mean, one of the first gigs we got was doing the Conor McGregor shoe campaign. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, we were getting some interesting stuff. And um, Nifty Gateway, I'm abbreviating the story, but Nifty Gateway um, 
contacted us and basically said, oh, we're fans and we've seen your stuff on Instagram and we think you, you should do a drop here. And like, I remember Misha calling me and neither of us even knew, I didn't know what the fuck, uh, I didn't even know what an NFT was. So, you know, we had to do some homework real quick and um, we're like, sure, you know what? Why not? So we, we did a drop with them and I don't know, maybe it did 50 grand, um, which, you know, in my world, still a lot of money. Sure. And, in Misha's world, st still a lot of money. And I think we kind of went, huh, isn't that interesting? <laughs> and didn't really think too much more about it. And then Nifty Gateway came back and said, you know, that, that went pretty well. We'd love to do another one with you. We were already working with Dead Mouse. We were doing a merch drop for him. With Mad Dog Jones? Not a drop, sorry. A merch, yeah. Like just the gig I, that we got, like designing merch for Mad Dog Jones. Mm -hmm. Or for, for Dead Mouse. Yeah. And I knew his lawyer for years, and so there's already a relationship there. And I said to Misha, like, what if we got him involved? Maybe he, you know, I said, I, I know enough about him that I'm pretty sure he owns a lot of his masters and a lot of his publishing. Maybe he can bring in, you know, some unencumbered intellectual property, and um, we can then do a drop featuring, you know, collaboration between Mad Dog Jones and Dead Mouse. I pitched it to Dead Mouse's people. They also were like, what the hell's an NFT? <laughs> and um, then they were like, yeah, okay. Um, so we, we very quickly did a deal. And it was funny because it was right at the end of the year, like December, mid-December. So it's like, oh, shit, we got to get a, this agreement together. Now, look, if, if you need a record contract, I've got 8 million templates on mm -hmm. my computer. But I didn't have anything for this. I mean, this I suddenly went, oh, God, like I'm going to have to actually earn my keep as a lawyer. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I had to create something out of the ether, like uh, this agreement. And so I did. And I think literally it was the last day before everybody disappeared for Christmas that year. We got the deal signed. Came back after the new year, did this drop. And that's the one that did, oh, God, I don't $400,000 wow. US, $500,000 US. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, boy. Um, this is a thing. This is a thing. And um, it kind of just went from there. Wow. And then the next drop's the one he did on his own again. Um, and it, that was so, that that period was fascinating because we had attracted all this attention with this Dead Mouse drop and um, and all these celebrities. Like, can I talk about Yeah, I guess I could talk about this. Yeah, thing. you can um, talk about it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's fine. The people, like, I got to give Misha so much credit. He's a smart man. And right away, he said, I don't want to be known as an NFT artist. I don't want to be known as the celebrity collaboration guy. We said no to Shakira. We said no to Post Malone. We said no to Tony Hawk. We said no to um, Rob Gronkowski. I mean, we got the most bizarro just in the wake of this because right. everybody was like, oh, my God, there's so much money to be made. Yeah. Um, and um, because Misha had big picture on his mind mm -hmm. and um so um it was funny uh, there's this agency i don't i don't want to make them feel shitty so i won't say who it is but one of the big three la agencies called one of the agents said hey man i can see you're right in the middle of all this nft stuff that's happening would you mind if we set up a call with some of our agents they're all so curious about this sure no problem well some of our agents got to be 30 people on that call so <laughs> zoom all over the world and um they're sort of saying to me so um you know, um, we, we represent a lot of big clients. I said, yeah, yeah, I know. And they said, so, you know, if you don't mind us asking, like, how, how did you do, how did you structure that dead mouse deal? I said, yeah, I don't mind I, telling you 50-50. Uh, mm -hmm. That seemed fair. He brings his name and his great music. We bring this great art. Just seemed fair. They said, okay. And one of the agents says, well, you know, we represent some very big artists and, you know, all due respect, Mad Dog Jones is not a well-known name right. in that world. Our artists are household names. Yeah. I said, yeah, but you're, you're getting confused about who's buying this stuff. Right. It's not college students spending 60 grand on an NFT. <laughs> it's collectors. It's crypto nerds and tech people. And I said, guess what? In their world, my guy's as big a name as your guy is. And she was like, mm, okay, well, fair enough. Well, the next drop we did was without a celebrity. And that's the one that did 4.1 million. <laughs> and in fairness, that agent did send me an email and said like um, two words, point taken. <laughs> they knew. <laughs>
Yeah. That's amazing. And then the rest is history. That's incredible. And so then did you start then intentionally accumulating NFT artists um, to no. represent or Not people, they started coming to you? Correct. Okay. And, um, and, and the rest is history. So one thing that I think uh, that I've heard you talk about is you have as an artist, this repository of assets, unreleased work, released work, you know, album covers, whatever. Um, and, uh, and I'd like to hear your perspective on the value of this stuff and how that relates and how that intersects with, with NFTs. Yeah. So I should say a couple of things. Like, first off, um, I am not a crypto guy. I don't have any problem with it. I'm just not, um, one of those people who's like, um, you know, um, obsessed with it or it's the future of finance or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't give a fuck. I'm just being honest. It's not my thing. My attraction to the NFT world was the art. Mm. I'm an art head. I'm good with business, but I, you know, art's what turns me on. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I was just like, okay, so we can take music, animations, computer programming, and create this new crazy art form. I love it. I love it. And th that was really the appeal for me. Initially, I wasn't thinking at all about how that intersected with my record label. That came much, much later. Um, and, um, but what, what you're referring to is, you know, what I have spoken about a, a couple of times, which is, you know, I own a record label co-own with Chad from Nickelback, um, mm -hmm. a record label that um, has 20 years worth of assets now. And I've been very careful all those 20 years to not encumber those assets. What does that mean? Well, example, um, the very first deal we did for distribution was with uh, Universal. And um, it was just understood that when you do a distribution deal, part of what you're giving the distributor is the right to distribute your digital music. And this is where not coming from the music business, I think, really helped me. Like, I think that was huge for me because I didn't have all the, you know, the baggage of like, well, this is just how it's done. Yeah. This is a standard way of doing it. I didn't care. I would just look at something and go, I don't give a fuck if that's how it's normally done. Um, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't need you to distribute my music digitally. It's as easy as uploading it to iTunes producer. This is before Spotify. It was really just the download store at that point. I said, so no thanks. Like, sorry, I'm not paying you 20% of the income to do something I can do for myself. Mm -hmm. They didn't like that universal and Randy Lennox and I fought about it a lot, but eventually it went our way. And so, and then, you know, we probably renegotiated our deal with them five times over 20 years. Every time they tried to get our digital rights, every time I'm like, I'm not going backwards. Right. And so um, that's just one example. So we don't have to worry about involving our distributor because this is part of the problem. Um, you know, and that's why I said earlier about Dead Mouse. part of the appeal of doing something with him is that he owns a lot of his own intellectual property. Right. If, he, if he had been on a major label, I would never even have suggested it because mm. they have to deal with their bullshit. You know, they're going to want most of the money and they're going to be shitty about everything. And, I, eh, you know, I just part of what I like about the NFT space is that it's there's kind of a freedom to it. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And um, so, yeah. So, I mean, um, here I am sitting on 20 years of this amazing content and I'm not just talking music music videos, artwork, um, photos, um, concert tickets, um, unreleased music. It's a treasure trove. And eventually I kind of went, we got to do something with all this. And the only reason we haven't done more is because the, the space kind of got all weird, <laughs> but it's getting on weird again. Yeah. And, um, and more to the point, we're not even selling them like, it's unfortunate what's happened with the in the world of NFTs. We have a little joke around the office, which is we don't use the N word anymore. <laughs> um, and do you call them digital collectibles or something like that? You know, we're still trying to land on the right thing, but yeah, something like that. We'll end up calling it uh, because to me, it was never about like the blockchain. That wasn't my again for me. It was about art. It wasn't about like showing that I'm against centralized banking. Like, no, 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 I'm not making a political statement here. I'm, I'm trying to take all this great 
content and repurpose it and reimagine it and allow fans to kind of experience it in a different way. That was the, the turn on for me. If, um, if we make some money on it, great. And if the artists make some money on it, great. But that's it. Like, uh, there was no bigger... I had no bigger agenda than just going, oh, wow, we could do so many cool things. So if I understand you correctly, you are kind of saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you have all these assets and, and you're not necessarily leverage, leveraging them for, na fin for financial gain at this point. Maybe you're using them more as a community building tool to kind of remind Nickelback fans why they're fans with giving them opportunities to connect again. And, and financial gain. So they will be- I'm not be... gonna say there, there isn't, but, but you see, this is part of the problem with the space these days, I think. I think one of the worst things that ever happened in this space was that people sale the one that did $69.5 million. Yeah. Cause that, they gave such a skewed perspective to everybody. <laughs> All of a sudden, everybody thought they're going to get rich real quick and everybody became an artist and everybody became a purchaser and gee, big surprise. The whole thing came crashing down. Um, I, I think there's a reasonable business model here. Uh, every sale doesn't have to be a $4.1 million windfall. Mm. We did a, a drop the first one we did. So we have a platform. It's called 604 Infinite. And um, the first drop we did was with an artist named Latch. And Latch is one of the guys in Coleman Hell. He's a different guy from Mad Dog Jokes. Okay. He took, he, he, he's got a, a vinyl album and the front cover is his face, just a big picture of his face. He took, he's a very good artist, um, not just musically, but you know, he's good at drawing and good at digital art. He took a, um, like a Sharpie, a white Sharpie and drew all, all over his face. Like drew a face on top of his face mm -hmm. on 11 vinyl records. Then we animated that. The NFT was the animation. Right. But if you bought it, you also got a physical record. You oh, got that actual record that he drew on. Yeah. Um, sold out. Snap, like 10 minutes. 20 minutes sold out. And were these fans of the band? Who knows? You don't know who they were. I don't even know. Okay. And the thing is, um, what a beautiful, like, to me, it was like, oh, man, like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Like, you know, nobody got rich, but who cares? Like, I think Latch probably put a few thousand dollars in his pocket. We put a couple thousand dollars in our pocket. We made some new fans. And we sold out. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, that's the model now going forward. Not like, oh my God, if we can't make $5 million, it's not worth it. No, 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 no. That's a different model. It's a different model. It's kind of like in the same way Spotify, you know, nobody gets rich off of one stream, but if you get enough people interested in it, then you can make some money on it. Do you see people, um, or do you see artists selling their music as NFTs? Do you see the whole industry moving in that direction? I don't know. I mean, I know there's a lot of talk of that, but the, uh, to me, it's like, call me crazy. Why would I bother wanting to buy music as an NFT when I could just stream it on Spotify? Like to me, that part doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing to me. Mm -hmm. Not a better thing, not a worse thing. A different thing in the same way that watching a music video on YouTube is different than listening to music on Spotify. They're different animals. So to me, they're different animals, but I think this is a really compelling animal. Like I think there's some really cool things you can do. We took um, the Mariana's Trench, you know, Mariana's Trench. Mm -hmm. We took their album Ever After, which was their big breakthrough album that made them famous all over the world, won a Juno, blah, blah, blah. And um, we animated it and added unreleased music. And it's beautiful. What did what did you animate? The... So the front cover okay. um, is you would almost think. I mean, that album's eleven years old or twelve, years, but you would almost think we designed it knowing there were going to be NFTs. Oh, really? The front cover is toy soldiers. Okay. And um, the band made up as toy soldiers, mm -hmm. so we animated it, and it's beautiful. Like it's a really beautiful revisiting, and then we took some old tour posters and animated them and added unreleased music. We're not sure when we're going to put it out, but. I mean, oh, so this me, album cover isn't out yet. This is a bit of a story, but I guess it's a, a cautionary tale. <laughs> when we kind of put it out there to the public that we might be doing this, their fan base rose up angrily. Oh, really? So we paused it. Why? Why were they upset about it? Yeah, NFTs are bullshit. Oh, okay. and environmental damage, and they're a bunch of ripoffs. I see. And it was brutal because it's like you know what. We, we made a point of using Polygon because it's the least environmentally damaging, at least mm -hmm. at the time it was, the least environmentally damaging thing. 
We were pricing them cheap. We weren't trying to, that's the whole point. We weren't trying to rip people off at all. I was actually so excited just because this art was so beautiful. Mm. And and as you know, I'm not just their manager, I'm also a huge fan. So right. it's like, I loved it. I kept going back and you know, listening to it and going, man, like I really love this. Like it, it's so <laughs> awesome if you're a fan of the band. I didn't want to hurt the band. I didn't want to do anything to hurt the band. So um, I fell on the sword very publicly. It was all my idea. It was all I me, see. which it kind of was. But I mean, it was like, it's all my idea. It wasn't the band. <laughs> Don't blame them. And it went away. At some point, I'm hoping we'll be able to put those out. And there are some artists who don't give a shit. They're like, yeah, I want to do this. Let's mm -hmm. put it out. So we have a bunch of artists who we've already got, um, you know, we're doing interesting stuff with. So um, we're just in the process of doing a new deal with somebody who's going to basically host our, our platform. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that by the fall, at the latest, we're regularly putting out cool stuff on that platform. Oh, interesting. Um, how do you balance the the need and the drive to make money and kind of the creative freedom of the artists? Oh, God. Uh, well, that's never been an issue for me. And I, th I think because I spent a good seven, eight years as an artist lawyer, before I owned a record company. So I got to see it from that perspective. And if I ever had to deal with another idiot A&R guy who came into a recording studio and said, yeah, that's pretty good, but can you make it sound more like that song that's number one right now? What, what's an A&R guy? Uh, artists in a repertoire, those are the people at record companies who sign bands. Okay. And are sort of responsible for, they sign them and then they're responsible for how the record sounds. And you know, like I had to deal with so many jackass guys like that. <laughs> that I just vowed, and remember my partner's Chad Kruger in this, who's an artist. Yeah. There's no way we were gonna do this if it wasn't gonna be the most artist-friendly label. So, number one, right in our contracts, we don't have creative control, artist does. Oh, interesting. I, I'm not, you know, and if that makes it sound like, oh, I'm a nice guy, that's not why I did it. I did it because I believe in it as a business move. You know, art, um, what sells art? Honesty sells art, honesty sells art. And if you're messing around with somebody's art, it's not honest anymore. I'd never want to go to an artist and say, hey, can you make it a little more this, a little more of that? Who the fuck am I to, I'm not the artist, I'm not the one making the art. So um, my job is to sell art. An artist's job is to make art. Those are different jobs. I let artists make their art. I don't interfere, ever. So then if they've made something, um, you then find a way to sell what they've created yes. instead of here's what I can sell, make this. 100%. And that's... Um... Now, I get asked my opinion often by artists. Sure. And I'll give an honest opinion. But it would rarely be like, you know, oh, I think you have to, you know, uh, there's minor stuff I might talk about. But, you know, when I think back of all the successes of the label, and there's been a lot, and we're in our 20th anniversary, and we're actually putting out a 20th anniversary vinyl compilation. And honestly, I got emotional listening to it. I was kind of like, wow, we've had a lot of hits. Like, a shocking number of hits and um i mean call me maybe is the biggest selling digital single in history i believe really oh it's if it's not i mean it keeps other song it keeps sure. going back and forth with a couple other songs but wow if you had any idea what that song i mean it's only like the 14th or 15th diamond certified album or song in the states what's diamond <sighs> i want like 100 say, million i think it's 10 million 10 million yeah wow like the amount of action on that like, how do you think I bought that building in Strathcona? I mean, that was, I call it the house that called me maybe. Building. Really? Yeah. Like the, the economic, you know, uh, shocking, um, shocking how much like revenue that song has brought in, how much, you know, that, that song's brought in. But I mean, I, I would never, um, like to me, the whole concept of trying to tell an artist how to make art is, is not only offensive, it's stupid. Has that uh, been, uh, has that drawn talented artists to you because you have a reputa reputation for being artist friendly? I would hope so. I mean, I have a real mixed reputation, I think, in the business myself personally, and it's partly because I have a tendency to say stuff that gets me in trouble and, and to piss off certain people and usually people in the business. I'm not a real fan of the music business. I'm a fan of business. I'm a fan of music. I'm not <laughs> necessarily a fan of the music business. And even when Nickelback, Nickelback just got inducted into the Hall of Fame at the last Junos, um, I didn't go. It was in Edmonton. And I called each of them. Like yeah. I called Chad and I was like, hey man, um, do you care if I go to this? Because they know how much I hate stuff like that. I hate being around the music business. I was like, hey man, if, if I don't go to this, are you? Are we cool? 
He's like, dude, how long have I known you? Said, well, almost 30 years. Yeah, I would have been surprised if you did go. Right. One of them was a little pissed off I didn't go, but that, that's, another, <laughs> that's another story. But, I mean, the, the, the point is I, I have no patience or interest in that. Right. Um, um, and so, um, but, yeah, I would say that, yes, I would say that our reputation for that definitely has helped the label. Do you feel the same way about, like, the NFT business in the way you feel about the music business? Yes. 100%. You just don't like... What is it that you don't like? Um, I don't like art that isn't honest. I don't like dishonest art, where you're trying to appeal to a certain audience by making the art a certain way. Interesting. Like, oh, right now it seems like, you know, trap music is really popular, so I'm going to release a trap song. Well, are you releasing it because that's an honest expression of where you're at? Or are you releasing it because you're just trying to copy somebody else and make some money? If you if it's the latter, I don't have a problem with that. Like, but I don't want that on my label. That's not exciting to me. That's not interesting to me. That's boring and just you know, I'm in it for for the art and the fact that I think we've proven that if you leave artists alone and let them do their thing, um, that it's much more appealing than um, doing it any other way. What do you think um, the future of art NFTs, not unrelated to music? What does this look like? Because one thing we often hear about is, well, what is the utility? What does this get me aside from the piece of art? Does it give me access to a community? Does it give me access to other drops? Like, what is the utility? So what is your what are your thoughts on um, the future of NFTs from an artistic perspective? Yeah, it's interesting because when I'm dealing with, like, Mad Dog Jones or Fuck Render or Victor or, you know, those artists that we work with, um, it's a very different headspace than when I'm dealing with stuff to do with 604. Because 604 is really about appealing to music fans. Whereas when I'm w working with those artists, it's about appealing to um, visual art fans. Um, very different worlds. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I, I've always had a tendency to be very ins insulated in my approach to things. Um, even this building that I, that I built in, in, in Railtown... Um, it was largely a function of my distaste for um, the music business in the sense that I wanted to cut out every single middleman in our life. We have a soundstage, so we can make videos right there and even do concerts in our own building. We have recording studios. We have everything in-house. Now, not all our artists record in-house, but the whole point was I want to create a hub of content production. And... Um, and that's exactly what I did. And um, I um, just feel that, um, you know, when I sign an artist, the artist has already passed the audition at that point. Mm. You don't have to keep auditioning over and I have to tell them that sometimes. Like, just go make your record now. Just go make your art now. So I think that part of the reason, like, Fuck Render and, and Victor Mascara and, and, and um, Mad Dog Jones um, are so successful is that they're honest in their art. Mm. I never talk to them about, like, they might say, hey, do you like this piece I do? I was like, oh, I fucking love it. But I'm never like, well, I think you should shade the color. <laughs> Who, uh, that would be so outrageous as far as I'm concerned. And, um, you know, I think the reason they have built fan bases is people love what they're doing. Right. They don't need me interfering in that. Did they have, so so these NFT artists, did they have big fan bases before they, you got a hold of them? I kind of help Mad Dog Jones. It all happened together. Sure. I'm not taking credit for it. I want yeah. to be real clear about that. Yeah. But certainly <clears throat> it happened together. Fred and Victor definitely were already on their way. Mm -hmm. I definitely not taking credit for that. I just kind of helped keep them organized in what they were doing and kind of tried to keep a strategy there so that we're not just doing things to do them. Mm -hmm. We're doing them for a reason and that we've got goals, big goals. And, hey, is doing this particular drop going to help us get to this goal over here? Everything has to kind of fit into that path. Right. It has to be sort of leading to a certain way. So, no, I'm not going to take credit for their fan bases. Um, I was kind of around as they were building. Right. I helped them build them, but I, it wasn't because of me. 
Yeah. Um, what is the future for your artistic representation around NFT artists? Um, and, and it's not 604 Records that works with NFTs. Simkin you have a separate artist management. Simkin artist. So what is the future of Simkin Artist Management? Well, I, I love it and I'm going to keep doing it. I mean, we're all, um, I was going to say struggling, but that's the wrong word. We're all trying to figure out what the best route forward is. You know, I, I think all of my artists very much want to start doing things um, that aren't just NFTs, but they were like that before. That's like a new thing because of what's happened. You know, I don't think any of them look at themselves as like, I'm just an NFT artist. Right. They're like, I'm an artist who happens to do NFTs, but I want to do other things as well. Fuck Render makes sculptures. Uh, Victor can paint. Um, Mad Dog Jones designs clothing. We're in the middle of, and this one I can't talk about because I've signed an NDA, but we're, we're in the middle of um, designing a clothing uh, line for a very big car company and a very big, um, shoe brand wow um with mad dog drones yeah and that's got nothing to do with nfts nothing to do with nfts um so i'm loving that as well and yeah so i, I mean i find it fascinating mm. i find it fun and i love the people and um so yeah i'm just going to keep doing what i'm doing which is helping them maneuver through this you know, sort of insanity of the NFT world. <laughs> I love that. Um, I think it, what's what's interesting is you have this perspective of like respecting the artists and letting them do what they're good at, which allows you to do what you're good at. Um, and it kind of brings this remarkable relationship between you and the artist, which seems to have worked really, really well for you. Why is it that that's so different in the business you work in? Why are you an outlier when that seems to be a natural, uh, a, a natural combination? I think it's what I said earlier. I think um, it's the fact that I didn't come from the music business. Because, um, you know, a lot of people who do the kind of job that I do, um, and I don't, I'm not going to say this to be funny, um, but are failed musicians. Like, um, you know. <laughs> that is funny, though. <laughs> but, you know, how many people does it work out for? Like, not many. No, like 99.9% .9 of people I, who try fail. I myself am a musician. Well, there you go. And I think I've failed. And there's, again, nothing wrong with that. And people want to make music in their basement for themselves. Exactly. Nothing wrong with that either. Um, but for those people who aspire to actually make a living or become famous through it, very few of them succeed. So when it doesn't work out, I think for a lot of them, it's like, well, shit, you know, I guess I'm not going to end up being a famous singer, but I love music so much. I still want to be involved. I'm going to go back to school and become an entertainment lawyer. Right. Or I'm going to start a record company. Or I'm going to start a management company. That wasn't me. I just happened to move into an apartment building. Like that, I didn't. I didn't have any baggage, and in fact, those first few years, when I was, you know, starting off as an entertainment lawyer, I, I really brought a lot of that criminal law. You would think nothing could be more different from each other: criminal law, entertainment law. But the similarities are pretty shocking. Um, you know, it's you and your usually poor client <laughs> up against this huge monolith in right. the case of criminal law, the state, in the case of the record business, major labels. Right. And I often had that kind of uh, attitude about it. Like, I remember once, and I remember the story spread in the business, and it really gave me a reputation early, but I was dealing with a major label, I won't say who, and... Uh, they were like, uh, well, you obviously don't know what you're doing because this is just the way it's always been done, Jonathan. And I said, yeah, and you know what? Once upon a time, slavery was standard too. <laughs> and I know that story kind of spread, you know. Um, cause now, did I get better deals for my clients? I don't know, maybe. Um, but if nothing else, my clients knew whose side I was on. And you would think in this business, well, of course, if you're their lawyer, in this business... You really never know. People never really know. Like, is that is my own lawyer really on my side, or is my lawyer more worried about not pissing off the major label so that he'll get more business from the major label in the future? Whereas I never thought that way. I was so just about my clients. So the major labels really, especially early on, hated me. They would even say to artists, oh, "Okay, well, you're going to need a lawyer. Don't get Jonathan Simkin," which of course made most of them come to me. <laughs> Why doesn't such and such label want us to talk to you? Right. Because they think I'm difficult to deal with. Why do they think you're difficult to deal with? Because I won't put up with their bullshit contracts. We're hiring you. Did that cause you to lose deals? Yep. 100%. Um, from the record labels or from artists? Both. Because, I mean, some artists are like, look, we really want to hire you, but, you know. We're Universal really... hates you, so. Yep. Yeah. That kind of thing. Okay. I mean, there's one theme that I... I draw from our conversation and, and that's your value of honesty. You look for honest art. You want artists to be honest. You share your thoughts. Um, 
semi unfiltered or fully unfiltered. Yeah, go to my Twitter account, people, if you want <laughs> if you want some unfiltered uh, conversation. And 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 I think your approach is just be like, if you're honest, you'll be able to do the things that you want to do, and you'll feel good about yourself at the end of the day. And your artists, are, in your case, are going to appreciate the fact that you defend them and fight for them honestly. Yeah, and if you and and if you have success being honest in your art, it's a deeper success. It's a deeper, more satisfying more resonating kind of success and that's how you build a fan base too like i look at someone like say josh ramsey from Ariana's trench who's always been so honest about his life you know he was a junkie um so was i so that's one reason we kind of bonded early on was we were both middle class high school junkies uh wow but you know he's always been very honest on various struggles in his life and you know what that has caused his fan base to just love him and just appreciate that you know what they're hearing is the real deal that they're not just getting some you know crap that somebody's doing because they think it'll make them more popular with the kids you know yeah. like you're getting an honest expression from this guy every single time out and um as a fan of music that means everything to me if you were to give one piece of advice to artists that isn't about being honest, because I think that's a piece of advice you've given quite clearly here. What else would you say to the young artist who wants to be a musician, who wants to be an NFT artist, who wants to be a painter, whatever it is, and they want to, they want to, you know, make a living um, providing value to society through their artistic expression? What do you say to them? I think, um, I think that um, you have to work your ass off, and that might be stating the obvious, but um, you know, if it's a musician. I will often say, you know, how many songs you write today? Mm. None? Why? Or, hey, I just wrote this great song. Great, go write another one. Write and write. If that's who you are, if that's what you want to be every day, write. Wake up and write. Like, And same with artists. Keep going. Make another one. Make another picture. Make another drawing. Make another NFT. You know, don't, you, you can't be self-satisfied. Like, you have to be pushing yourself. And, and the most successful artists I know are the ones who were like that. They were so self-driven to just keep going, keep going, keep going. And, um, you know, to me, like, great art is a, tends to be a function of two things. Um, inherent um, talent mm -hmm. and craft, hard work. Um, that part, and that's how I've built my little empire, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm... I'm in my office till three in the morning every night. Like I'm, I'm, you gotta work your ass off if you're really dedicated to something. Wow. And, um, I'm not saying people don't do that, but they don't do it enough. Like you, 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 you really, really need to dedicate completely. And, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll sign a young artist and, and their parents will come in and say like, we're really worried. Like we think that he should be going to school or should, and I always say the same thing. I said, you know what? I'm a parent. I get that. I, I would feel the same way. Make a deal with your kid. You got until you're 24. Right. Work your ass off on this. And what's 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 reevaluated at 24? Because at 24, you're not too old that if you decide you want to go back to school, great, go back to school. You can't give it a half-ass shot. You, you, you can't do half measures if you want to be a successful artist. You have to throw yourself into it in your entirety. And if you're not willing to do that, then the odds of you succeeding are pretty slim. Amazing. That is, that's such, that's such helpful um, advice and feedback. It's been really great interviewing you and, and chatting with you, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, this is, fun. this is, uh, it's such a pleasure to learn some of the history and some of the story and also um, uh, hear kind of your thoughts on the industry. So I really appreciate you yeah, being with me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, man. Okay.